exist or uh, by the 19th they just they disappear yeah, uh, strange that and then it also was, another thing you a lot of people might not have noticed was that a lot of the online content and the websites and the YouTube channel, it was all taken down immediately. It's, it's yeah. Like you said, it's almost like they disappeared. It, it was, and it, it was almost like as soon as the result was in, yes, Scotland just packed up. They were almost like they had their bags packed already and were out the door, and everything was gone. And I think so many people felt that, you know, where do we go? And I, I was looking at our website and just seeing people leave and leave and leave, like resignation emails coming in left, right, centre, joining the SSP, joining the Greens, joining the SNP. I was, you know, asking our press guys to put out a statement saying we'll, be, we'll release a statement within a few days. But it got to, the, I think we ended up doing it the next day purely because people were just leaving and just, you know, looking for something else. And I don't know, I think it was probably about a week later. I, I thought about it long and hard for a week. And I thought, you know, I, I, by then I had a bit of a thick skin about the way we were treated within the party and the way I was you know, treated within the party, and it didn't really concern me because it's politics, and I understand that being on the opposite side, you do have to face people who will stop at nothing and will do anything to try and discredit you, and that's that's the nature of the game, unfortunately. But I think the things that, that stuck in my head the most was Joanne, Jim Murphy, who you mentioned, hugging Annabelle Goldie and, and Clyde Bank, of all places. You know, if you hug a Tory as a Labour member, the very last place you would do it would be in Clyde Bank after the you know the history of, the, of that uh, area in Scotland of the Labour movement it, it was it was disgraceful and uh, Joanna Mott I think the week before the referendum was the, the final the final straw for me I think was when she was outside of Asda smiling when they announced that in an independent Scotland they would put up the places uh, of food and then you've got a Labour leader who Labour was always about protecting those who needed support smiling that. Uh, working class families would be struggling even harder than they are currently because as there was we'd be putting their prices up and I felt that it's just so sickening to be perfectly honest that I could no longer um, be a part of that, that party and so I went to my, my branch meeting so it must have been a Thursday and spoke to them and told them that I uh, had resigned my membership I then cut my membership into a yes badge and sent it uh, if you go on my Twitter uh, at Alan Grogan, you can see it. It's uh, it's there somewhere. I sculpted it into a yes sign and sent it to them with a Labour for Independence. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was probably about a week or so afterwards. I think that I finally did it. It was it was bizarre. It was strange because it was like leaving your family sort of thing. I'd been a Labour Party member for most of my life and always been involved in Labour even as a kid. It was it was a strange feeling, but. You know, it was the right it was the right decision, and I'm very happy where I am right now, and very happy to have made this choice. Mm. You said so. Thirty nine percent was mm. um, what the the number of Labour voters who voted for yes, yes. and that could have you know after your resignation and all the people defecting to other parties and stuff, that could have been a moment for Labour to kind of take a a look at itself and and, and reappraise the situation, at least have a more open debate about it within the party, but then. You know, it must have, I don't know if you, felt, if you felt it sort of validated your decision a bit when Murphy came in and went entirely in the opposite direction and it was just more SNP bad, SNP bad and, uh, you know, more unionist than ever and Labour mm. people suggesting that there should never, uh, Jack Straw, I believe, said that there should there should be some kind of law to make sure there's never enough other referendum and, and so on. Did you feel sort of validated when Jim Murphy came? When it came, when it came down to it, I mean, there were, there were two, there were two, you know, choices, and I think most people who I was still very uh, close with within the Labour Party, I think there were two two occasions there was mass exodus after the referendum, after September 18th, uh, in which the Labour Party lost huge numbers of members. The first one was September 19th, and the just general dissatisfaction. And the second time was when the Saturday that Jim Murphy got elected uh, as leader, and I think there was a huge... You know, I, I saw it from friends who had been saying to me, look, we get Neil Finlay in, let's fight to get Neil Finlay in, we can change things around. And uh, when Murphy got in, as you know, as anyone who wasn't looking at it with rose-tinted glasses would have saw, the writing was on the wall. And I think a lot of people realised then, and there are still some people within the Labour Party who are still clinging on to hopes of Jeremy Corbyn managing to become the Labour leader in, in the UK, which is, let's be realistic here, There's, he's got absolutely no chance. He's got, more ch he's got more chance of being uh, the Liberal Democrat leader than uh, the Labour leader. Yeah, I, I think I think it was vindication probably on the election 
and it was kind of what we told you. We told you so. We told you that it would, that it would happen that this way. That the end of the yes vote was the only chance to save the Labour Party and get it back to its traditional roots, or you are going to lose so many of your voters. They are they are sick and tired of it. They've had enough, and you know they did not listen. The unfortunate thing is that regardless of what happened in Scotland, was that we woke up to five more years of the Tories thanks to the ineptitude and the inability of Ed Miliband to project what a Labour Party is actually supposed to be about. And, you know, they're so lost in the Labour Party these days. I don't know. But it's a very unenviable job, whoever takes over, because they are so lost both nationally in Scotland and nationally in, in, the, in the UK. And obviously pulling in different directions as well, because the the major theme that you seem to hear from Labour down south is they need to go more towards the right. They need to go back towards the playwright and, and much more kind of right wing. And then in Scotland, they're trying to say we need to move more to the left. Um, but you've had uh, Kezia Dugdale saying, oh, no, we can't be completely separate from the party. And it, it, it does seem like there's no clear way for them to resolve this very quickly. I don't think another change of leader and another face on the posters is going to make much difference. No, and and I think I said this probably about 50 meetings, especially the first year, when the, the, the perception of Labour in, in the United Kingdom, uh, if you're sitting in Labour headquarters, is how do we win this next election? Scotland is safe. Wales is safe. North of England is safe. How do we win this Southern England English vote? We have to do what Tony Blair did and appeal to this Middle England, which is focusing on you know, tax tax relief. It's focusing on immigration. It's focusing on issues that are completely alien to what people in Scotland and people in the North of England and people in Wales were focusing on within the Labour Party. But that's where they felt they had to they had to win those people over because they saw Scotland and Northern England and Wales as safe. And what happened in the political tsunami of the referendum and the aftermath of the referendum, the growth of the SNP, completely blew that strategy that Labour have had for the last 30 years completely out of the water. They were no longer able to say Scotland's safe, Wales is safe, and Wales might not be safe much safer for much longer with the growth of Plaid Cymru. Northern England's safe. You kept were getting into areas in the north of England because they'd been abandoned by Labour. And it's the same, I mean, when I was out campaigning in my hometown in Dundee, we went to a place called uh, Fintry, and Fintry has been abandoned for such a long time. And the people that I spoke to were either old Labour, real Labour, traditional Labour voters, who were very keen to hear our message and agreed with it after a couple of months. And the other people were UKIP or BNP supporters. Because they were the only people who were going into these areas. Yes, and that included the SNP in this. The SNP had never been into Finley. Labour had never been into Finley. And it was the same in Northern England that UKIP were going into these areas that had been abandoned by the Labour Party in their pursuit of that Southern England vote. They now have to find a way to reconnect with the North of England. They now need to find a way to connect with the Labour support in Scotland and in Wales while also having to come to terms with how they are going to win that southern middle England vote. It's an incredibly difficult position. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. I'm not sure that the Labour Party can even be saved at this point, this point in time. Because with dwindling numbers of activists, which also means dwindling numbers of resources, and with less MPs, which also means less resources, it's, it is a very difficult position for them. But um, right, So the Jim, Jim Murphy area has been and gone in a blaze of what the hell was that all about? <laughs> Um, in a blaze of it, a, pink, a pink bus and uh, drinking at football matches. I think that was some of his parts. Um, yeah, and the Ed Miliband, the Ed Miliband era has been and gone in a blaze of, God, I don't know what that was all about as well. Um, the next question I'd like to ask you is just move it on a little bit. Is So, yeah, lots of people joined parties um, and most people went to the SNP, a lot of people went to the Green, and you chose the SSP, so why did you choose to move to them? I'm a socialist. If you're a socialist, you belong in a socialist party. I think that's that's the easy answer to, to say. And, it, and there, I, I understand there are socialists now in the SNP who are projecting, uh, trying to, to, to keep the party towards the left and even bring them further towards the left. My response to that would be, why would you try and move a nationalist party who's pro-capitalism, pro, uh, who's very neoliberal in their, their approach to their economics? Why would you try and make them socialists? When you have a Scottish Socialist Party there, which you can build and help to create a mass political party of socialists. So I've never quite got my, my head around that. 
I was never one of these Labour people who were anti SNP. I, you know, I never, I never understood that. I had differences with them. Some of my friends, SNP members, had differences with them, differences with uh, politicians. But I, for me, the Tories were always the, the enemy. Whereas I think now it's got to the stage in Scotland that the SNP are the enemy and the Tories are just, you know, secondary. And we've lost sight, so I say we, sorry, that's a force of habit. The, the, the Labour Party's lost sight of where the real enemy actually is, and that's the Tory party. And so for me, it was, it was a choice of not being in a political party at all. There were talks by several people of perhaps, you know, would there be an avenue for something else? Or the SSP, and I think for me, having spoken to Colin Fox, spoken to several people within the party, having worked with them and been very impressed with uh, their dedication, their commitment during the referendum, uh, how they had managed to overcome you know, a situation which, which really um, put them on a, a, the back step for a long period of time. And during that referendum, just see that regrowth and rebuilding take place and, and the potential that is there in the, in the Scottish Socialist Party to become a, a mass political party uh, off the left, I think was a very exciting opportunity to be involved in. And I think it was the, the only logical choice for me as a socialist was to join uh, the Scottish Socialist Party. Hmm. And um, the Scottish Socialist Party still uh, supports independence, obviously, it always has yes, since it yes, started. Yes, always and- has. This is the Scottish Independence Podcast, so we need to move on to that issue again, obviously. So what do you think of the prospects for Indyref 2? Now, there's a lot of things going on at the moment with will it be in the manifesto, SNP manifesto, will it not be in the manifesto? Should they be having one? Should there be some kind of commitment to if, you know, uh, if the majority of people vote for parties which support another referendum, then it's an obvious democratic thing? Or... Would it politically be wiser to leave it back until you're pretty sure you're going to win this time? Because now it seems the polls are very much 50-50. And so there's a lot of things in play there. What do you think of the prospects for um, referendum two? I think we have a referendum win, and I think it, I don't want to take credit for this for saying this, so I'll say it was Colin Fox. I think it was when he said uh, we, we have an independence referendum win we learn the, the lessons and where we went wrong in the last referendum. And I think we need to do that. I don't think that we started that campaign of a two-year campaign. I think it, it was only in the last three or four months when the, the, the message of radical independence of the SSP and Labour for Independence, Women for Independence, that, that you know, this was about fighting, campaigning against the Tories, having a, a country. That, and the SNP did pick up on that and moved with that as well in the last four or five months as well. But I think we were kind of floating along on trying not to rock the boat for 18 months of a two-year campaign. And I think we need to learn the lessons of that. I think we need to realise where the yes vote came from. And I think we need to continue to develop that. I think we need to realise that people who may have voted for the SNP in 2011, who voted for them uh, this year in the general election, and who will vote, no doubt vote for them next year in the Scottish Parliament in the elections, that they might not vote for independence. Uh, because, I mean, I, when I started, when we started Labour for Independence, I thought if we get to 35% of the Labour vote, we won. And the reason we didn't win was for all the, the good that the SNP has done throughout the campaign, it was the SNP areas which we felt, you know, that, or the SNP felt would be, you know, their SNP MPs, MSPs there, they can win those areas like Angus, uh, Aberdeenshire, uh, very farm-based, agricultural-based, voted for the SNP because they believed that they were good in government and that they were responsible people in government and that they could work with them in government. They weren't keen on the idea of uh, an independent Scotland in the slightest. But they would vote for them and have voted for them since and will continue to vote for them in, in government elections. So we need to learn where we need to target our message and what our message needs to be. And I think we need to, to make sure that those, those mistakes, and that's just, that's just one of the many mistakes you make throughout a two-year campaign. I don't agree that if you vote for enough SSP, Greens and SNP, MSPs, then it's a mandate for a referendum. For that, for that reason, that people will vote for political parties not solely based on independence. Much as the same that I had always voted for Labour, despite disagreeing with the leadership stance on independence. 
I think there needs to be a clear, and I think you mentioned that the polls are sort of around 